If you're in the room today or if you're listening to this and watching this online, apparently there's something about the science of mind that works for you. I want you to know that it's not that it's a better philosophy than other philosophies and other uh, faith, uh, uh, faiths, but it, it's what we do, it's what we believe, it's what we use because it works, because we've seen it work. We know that it works, and by having it, we have a better life. Don't we all want a better life? Of course we do. We want a better life. So there are several, uh, there are a number of elements that we talk about as uh, the science of mind, and we have to include faith in that. Even though faith is a word that was crammed down my throat when I was in, in a uh, Christian community as a child, it was used to me sometimes as a cop out. Uh, when I would ask a question that, that a teacher wouldn't want to answer, no, just have faith. Stop asking questions. And that really didn't work for me. So I haven't been one that really thinks that we have to have a strong faith, but then when you look at how you apply it here, it looks different. Because we're not saying that you have to simply have faith in an outside God, which is what I was told, that the, that the creator of the universe uh, it w is taking care of it, so just have faith that that's true. And that just didn't work for me. So, so now I have a different sense of what God is, which gives me a different sense of what faith is. I can work at it to it or at, with it in a different way that makes better sense. So uh, before I go off on uh, looking at what faith means, I want to look at what we have otherwise. If your life is going great, if everything seems to be working out, everything's cool, you don't need faith. So faith must be a tool that we use when things aren't working out our way. It's something that we, that we would count on at a time when everything seems to not be adding up, when the circumstances of our lives aren't taking us in the direction that we want. And that's great. That's, that's fine. That's the place to use it. That's the place. But you can't wait to develop faith when things are going poorly. You've got to have that pretty well set up and ready to go. Even though you may not use it all the time, you may not think of it all the time. And, and Holmes gives us some very direct ideas on how to do that. In fact, most spiritual teachers give us something to work on here. Uh, one of them is a, a man named Eric Butterworth who wrote a book called Spiritual Economics. If you haven't read Spiritual Economics, you, you, I encourage you to. It's one of the best books on metaphysics ever written. And Butterworth was a, was a, a unity minister. Uh, he was in uh, New York City. In fact, he and um, Raymond Charles Barker ha both had uh, uh, services on Sunday morning at Lincoln Center. And the, the, the thing was, is they were both very popular, and people would say that if you got to one of them and it was full, you would immediately go to the other one, maybe hoping that there was a, a seat available there, and often there was. So uh, that's the idea, and, and one of the things, but whoops, I'm going to skip up here. To there and tell you that what Butterworth said about faith was is your faith is the key to transcending human limitation. And I think he nailed it there. I think that's what it is. It's, it's this idea that we have limited thoughts. We have limited ideas about how life works. But when you incorporate something more mystical, something more uh, absolute in the sense of faith, you get a different result. You get a different outcome. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to go looking for something outside of ourselves because everything we're looking for is already at the point of us. It's already here. It's already real. It's already happening. So all we have to do is get clear about that, and then we can come to a place of having that work out in our lives and have, by having the, a faith that, that is functional. Faith has to be functional. It can't just be theoretical. It's practical in the sense that in the sense that it, it, it is something that we can use. So here's what Holmes said. One of the three, I have three major quotes from him, and they're big because he wrote a lot about it. But I think he, he did some good work right here. If we have faith in ourselves, in humanity, in the universe, and in God, that faith will light that place in which we find ourselves. 
And by the light of this faith, we will be able to see that all is God. And the light shed on this faith will light the way for others. We become conscious of darkness only when we are without faith. For faith is ever the light of our day and the light of our way, making that way clearly visible to us, even when to all others it may be inundated with obstacles. So if you don't have faith, your life can be inundated with obstacles. Anybody want to argue that point? Isn't it true that if you don't have some structure to base how you see life working, you're going to end up with this this thing of life is hard, that life keeps hammering me. Uh, I, I had a, a dear friend for many years, still a friend, but not, not, not around much in my life anymore, who used to say, I got up every morning expecting life to mess with me. And he didn't use the word mess, but that's what he meant. And if you don't have a faith in how your life, and Holmes says, in humanity, in ourselves, in humanity, in the universe, and in God, he's not saying go find an outside God and have faith in that, hoping that that outside God will solve your problems, but have a faith that all this stuff works together, and it's all working all the time. If you have that faith, then you're going to have an outcome that's going to work for you. And if you have a condition that shows up in your life otherwise, at least you have a way to address it by knowing there's something greater going on. And it's not going on over there. It's going on right where you are, right where I am. That's the only place it matters because what's going on out there isn't having the same impact as what's going on right here ever in our lives. So the truth is that we must work from that place to create the life that we want. And if we do, then what we've set down in all of that are the limitations that we have picked up somewhere. Of course, this is rigorous work. This isn't uh, uh, something that just comes naturally. So much of this experience of being in form on planet Earth looks separate. It looks like I, me, and you're you, and, and, and everything is, is different and separate from us. And the truth is that there is nothing separate, that it's really all together as one, which means that we can't even play that separate game with God. The outsideness of God doesn't work. It isn't real. The presence of the divine is at the point of you and me. It always has been. It always will be. But when we forget it, it becomes useless for us. It doesn't help us if we don't know it, if we're not living from it, if we're not seeing life that way. And as much as we talk about oneness in this place, I still believe that there are lots of people that call themselves students of the science of mind or metaphysicians or whatever other name you want to give it that believe in dualism that live from that place of dualism. I gave a talk at, at, at the International New Thought Alliance uh, annual congress one year, and I just, I got up there and just laid out this oneness thing about how there is no separation. This, this thing that we have that helps us make, make sense of the physical world is more of the illusion than the, the, the truth of oneness, that that's a true reality. And I gave it to him. And bless his heart, the guy that came up and did, did the prayer right after me, come up. The guy that came up on the stage after me went into a totally dualistic uh, uh, prayer, talking to an outside God. And I just shook my head. <laughs> so I know there are lots of folks that still struggle with this. You know, there are times when I do. I don't want you to believe that I've got this thing all figured out and, and use it every second of every day. It's not true. The truth is, is that it's a constant reminder of how life is supposed to work. And from that constant reminder, we get to a place that lets us know that this is the, the higher truth. And it's really the place where we can change things. If we play in that world of, of, of dualism, of oneness, uh, or not of, of oneness, of not having oneness, if we play in a world, as Barbara calls it, Tunis, although that's a city in Africa, uh, I, I, no, it's a country in, in Africa. The city is Tunisia. So, I'm, I, but I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I get it backwards? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank, thank you for your geography help there. I really needed that. Okay, so the, 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 the point that I want to make is that we have to continue again and again and again to focus on this idea of the, there really being only one thing going on. And it, it's happening at the point of us. It's happening at the point of you. And when you know that and you live from that, you can have faith that everything is working out. 
If we're all separate, then I don't know where you get that kind of faith. Then your faith is in something outside of you, which again to me has never worked. So let's move to another idea. This is my current definition of faith. To me, faith is the ultimate application of consciousness. Because in our lives, it's so easy to fall into this idea of separateness and to have all the troubles and challenges of that separateness. But when we remember the truth of who we are, I think that gives us truly the opportunity to move beyond that limiting thought that somehow things are happening to us and that we're in trouble. Now, this thing that's happening with Barbara is, is uh, uh, playing a big role in my life, and I'm sure it is in everybody's life. Now that last week I uh, shared uh, the conditions of what she was going through, it's, of course, out there in the world, and people are, are sharing that information. I have no idea how they're sharing it, and I don't want to make anybody wrong, but I, I do know that I'm getting emails from people uh, about this, and there's, an, there's an, an energy in it of sadness and of sorrow. And that's not helping. That's not helping me. It's not helping Barbara. So I want to again encourage anybody that talks about this to talk about the positive elements of it. And I'm going to share some things that I think are positive right here. But the, the one that I want to bring to this point right now is that I got an email from someone who found out about it, who is a student of this teaching, and said to me that she's getting this idea that maybe Barbara is going through all of this right now so that she can show us how to have faith and how to rise above it, and that that's, that's her current teaching. And if that's the case, I wish you to let me know ahead of time. <laughs> but I can go with that, because I find that Barbara's one of the most powerful people I've ever known. And that this is some kind of a, of a way to demonstrate the power of this teaching, I'll go with it. I can, I can do that. And if there's something else going on, I can go with that too. But right now, that one kind of works for me. So I'm going to play with that for a while. The ultimate application of consciousness. So that's what we're talking about here. And I'm going to take a moment just to make sure where I am. In the science of mind, that says, uh, it says, rather than having faith in God, we should have faith in the faith of God. This is a very popular line in our teaching. Rather than having faith in God, have a faith of God. Have the faith of God. I want to talk about that for a minute. It was, it was the quote that I, we put up at the beginning of the celebration. And I was confused by that when I first heard it. How do you have the faith of God? Why would God need faith? Well, immediately I'm thinking outside of, uh, uh, I'm thinking of an outside God that's all-powerful and all-knowing, but that uh, doesn't need to do what I do. Mm -mm. It's all the same thing. So having, what I've come to with this is that having the faith of God simply means that we're clear about who we are, that we're clear about how life works. We understand the law of spirit, and we use that law. There is no difference between being uh, having faith and having fear. They both work exactly the same way. That if you have a thought that something isn't working, that's what you're demonstrating into your life. If you have a thought that something is working, that demonstrates in your life. It does it exactly the same way. So really this idea of faith is simply an advanced tool for getting you to the place you want to be as opposed to the place you don't want to be. The law doesn't change between faith and fear. It doesn't change between faith and uncertainty. It's the same law. It applies the same way. The question is, what are you thinking? What are you putting your attention on? What do you believe is so? What do you know? From any of those angles, what you've got is either something that limits you or something, something that frees you. Faith is freeing. Faith allows us to have the life that we want to have. 
Without it, what are we going to do? How are we going to go there? Here's another one from, from Holmes. In order to have faith, you must have a conviction that all is well. What I just said. In order to keep faith, we must allow nothing that will weaken this conviction. Faith is built up from belief, acceptance, and trust. So belief, acceptance, and trust. Belief, acceptance, and trust. So I must believe the highest reality I possibly can. I must accept that. And though I can't see it, and there's, that's a, there's that element of faith. Faith is always based on the unseen. If I can't see it, I still trust it so, with absolute conviction. And if I can do that, the more I can do that, the more likely it is that I'm going to experience that as my life. And I'm going to get the things in my life and the experiences and the outcomes that I desire more than the ones that I don't. I believe that we're all on a spiritual path, no, no exceptions. And I think all that we're experiencing is spiritual experience. But the whole idea of the science of mind is that we can craft that. Are, th are there things happen that we don't want to happen? Pretty much everybody has those. The question at that point is, what do you do with it? Do you understand that there's something bigger and greater going on? And do you seek to overcome some limiting thought or some limiting experience? Of course. I don't know how to do that without faith because I have to move from that which is physical and that which is demonstrated through my senses into something that is much greater and much more powerful that I may never be able to touch, but I may always be able to know and have the outcome that I desire. We're going to do this one last quote. It's another big one. He's got a whole section on faith in the textbook. It's quite amazing. Pure faith is a spiritual conviction. It is the acquiescence of the mind, the embodiment of an idea, the acceptance of a concept. If we believe that the spirit incarnated in us can demonstrate, shall we, we be dis, uh, disturbed by what appears to be to contradict it? Boy, I struggle with that. Let me read that sentence again. If we believe that the spirit incarnated in us can demonstrate, shall we be disturbed by the appearance of to contradict this. In other words, so something doesn't look like we want it to look. It's a problem, right? We see it as a problem. Do we, do we give any credence to that? Do we focus on that? Do we make that the, the, the object of our attention? No, we don't. We, we know something greater. We shall often need to know the truth that we announce is superior to the condition we are to change. If we are speaking from the standpoint of spirit, then there can be no opposition to it. There can be no opposition to it. But we must look at it from the perspective of spirit. Now it's sounding like we're getting the faith of God. Because we're looking at it from that divine perspective. That something important is going on. We may not recognize it, but to get caught up in the idea that it's wrong, it's bad, it's, it's, uh, it's a challenge, it's a problem. If we get anywhere in all of that, then we've lost our faith. Because there's something greater going on. And that's what Holmes wants us to know. And again and again in my life, I've seen this proven. When I, when I think something's a problem and I focus on it as a problem, I get the problem. And the problem gets worse. And when I don't, I think it gets better. It certainly gets better in my mind. Even if it's just me making peace with it. Something's getting better. We've got a, sign, we got a, a thing up in, over our kitchen sink that says, something wonderful is about to happen. And I really lean into that quite a bit. Something wonderful is about to happen. Don't think there's a problem here. Don't, don't focus on the problem. Don't see something is wrong. Something wonderful is about to happen. And if I believe that to the depths of my experience, something wonderful is going to happen again and again and again. And that can only be good. That can only work for me. So here's what I want to share with you today about this journey with Barbara. As I mentioned last week, uh, we were just at the beginning of this discovery phase that Barbara had scheduled last Thursday, uh, two kinds of scans. One's called a CT scan and one was called a bone scan. 
And uh, we went down to uh, a party hospital, uh, which is in the county south of us, and, uh, and they did those scans last Thursday. And on Friday, we met with uh, our daughter-in-law's best friend, friend from college, uh, the, a woman that was a bridesmaid at her wedding. I did the wedding. Barbara played uh, mother of the groom. And uh, um, someone we, we had known 20 years ago, but uh, still had a relationship with. So we went to the center where she works, and, and we discovered the responses to uh, these, these scans. And the first thing she said was, we found no apparent cancers beyond the tumor that Barbara has. However, because they always got a however, uh, there were some abnormalities uh, in her body, one uh, in her clavicle and one in her femur. And we're, uh, we, we can't tell from this what, what that is. So we want to do what's called a PET scan. Another scan, another place, do another scan. And I, okay, we'll go do, do another one, and that's scheduled. Barbara's going to do it tomorrow. And then there was more information. One was, is that even though Barbara had had a biopsy of the tumor and of a lymph node, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the lymph nodes in the CT scans did not show any cancer. And what I said immediately was, uh, that it was a remission. The doctor ignored me completely and said, I think that they just had a bad angle on the CT scan. I like my answer better. And then she gave Barbara a, an examination while we were there. And she, uh, she felt all around under her arm and, and everything. And she didn't say a word. Now, when we were with the surgeon a week earlier, a little over a week earlier, uh, the surgeon said, I, I feel a lymph node that's enlarged. Well, this doctor didn't feel that. Hmm. So I'm going, okay, this is starting to work here. And then one of the things they do is they measure the tumor. So she pulled out her little device, and she's measuring the tumor. And she says, huh, it's smaller than the numbers from the surgeon. So what we're working on right now is the plan with the surgeon is, is we're going to do chemotherapy. We're going to do chemotherapy. Listen to me, Barbara. Forgive me for that. Barbara's going to do chemotherapy, and it's the kind of tumor that is responsive from chemotherapy and will shrink. That's because it has the right recept receptors for that. So the, the surgeon said, if it shrinks to half its size, we can take it out uh, with a process called lumpectomy rather than a mastectomy, which would be a removal of a, a much more larger area. So uh, uh, she measured it. It was, it was smaller. Then we started talking about how we're doing chemo. And uh, I've reported all this to our practitioners and to a select number of ministers that are close to us. Uh, some of which have gone through uh, similar bouts with cancer and come out the other side whole. And that's our plan right now. And i got to tell you how deeply grateful I am to our practitioners for the consciousness that they're bringing to this. They are, are, they are defiant in knowing that, that Barbara is healthy. They are accepting nothing less, which to me means that they're playing the role of God they're saying, I speak with the voice of the divine, and I know the truth. And this one, Barbara Waterhouse, is healthy and whole. God bless them for that. That's what we teach. That's what we believe. And this may be the way that Barbara is teaching the whole world this great lesson about how the science of mind works. So hold those thoughts. And if you tell somebody about what's going on with Barbara, which you have the absolute right to do, Tell them the whole story. Tell them that she's making amazing progress even before they start the uh, therapies. We have started our work. We are doing that work. We are clear and we have a great faith. We have the faith of God that this is working out in our favor and all is well. I love you. Thank you.